Today is the start of a new series on this channel, or a new set of series where I cover historical chess tournaments, something that I'm really excited for because I love history, hence the name of the channel, Chess Centurion. I'm also studying history at university. Anyway, this will be done in kind of like a format how current chess tournaments are covered, but with historical chess tournaments. And this one is kind of crazy, and I've never heard of it before, but it's really interesting. So I'll give you a bit of um, context. If you want to skip to the first game, skip to the first game. But a bit of context that's really interesting. So Avro sponsored this chess tournament. That's kind of how they got ran at that point, because there wasn't much money in chess. I think uh, Emmanuel Lasker, he made a big deal of it in like the early 1900s, how it wasn't a viable career. So he wanted it to be. And so Avro were a Dutch broadcasting company, and this tournament was held in the Netherlands, and they organized and sponsored this tournament. It was played across several Dutch cities, I think like Rotterdam, Amsterdam, Hague, maybe? I don't even know if that's a city. <laughs> a couple others, anyway. So uh, you can pull up the Wikipedia page and tell me why I'm wrong. But the point of this tournament was to bring together the eight strongest chess players in the world at that point. And as you can see uh, just below me here, these were the eight strongest players. Botvinnik, Alekhine, Ryshevsky, Fine, Capablanca, Floor, Kerez, and you. Six of those players, I, you know, I'm really familiar with. Floor and Fine, not so much. Um, but they perform very well in this tournament. And I would encourage you not to look up how the tournament goes because we're going to be covering every single round each day probably um and it's a crazy tournament really interesting and it's so interesting how the players used to play back then it's very different from chess now and so anyway they gathered together the eight best players in the world right these are the eight highest rated players and the goal was to try and find a challenger for alexander alakine because he was a long reigning world champion at this point for like, I don't even remember how long, but at least 20 years, um, at least until he died in 1946. But as you can see, this took place in 1938. And by the time the tournament ended, the Second World War began like a year later, which meant that they couldn't organize a match against Alakine. I'm not going to tell you who won the tournament, by the way. You're going to have to stick around for the future videos to find out. And... So, yeah, they couldn't play the match because Alakine, well, sorry, because of World War II. But then Alakine died in 1946, a year after World War II ended in 1945. And that meant that FIDE now needed to get another tournament together to decide who would be the world champion. Because nobody could challenge Alakine at this point. Five of the players from this tournament were recalled in 1948 to take part in this tournament. Capablanca and Alakine were not recalled because they'd both passed away at that point. And Salomon Floor, I think that's how you pronounce it, he was also not recalled. He was replaced by Vasily Smyslov. I don't know why. Maybe he just didn't play. Please let me know if you do know why that was the case. And... Um, yeah, it was very interesting tournament that had important ramifications for the future of chess world champions because it affected how the 1948 tournament had turned out. So anyway, I know this is a very long intro. If you skipped ahead, that's cool. Let's get into the first game. This is very interesting. I hope you enjoy. All right, let's get into game one between Salomon Floor and Jose Raul Capablanca from, I think it was Czechia at the time, and Cuba. So, by the way, stick around for the last game between Botvinnik and Fine, because that's a crazy one. And they actually had commentary notes from Fine um, annotated with the moves, which is really interesting to see. Anyway, this game, it's not that interesting, because, you know, it's top-level chess. Things, I know this was like 80 years ago, 90 years ago even, 85, whatever. But top-level chess was still top-level chess. We have a Slav defense, knight f3, knight f6. I play the Slav a lot, so it's very interesting to see how Capablanca handles this position. He takes here. So the way that I tend to play this position, I'm not comparing myself to Capablanca whatsoever. 
the way I tend to play it is in like a semi-slav structure. And if white goes for this sort of setup, uh, okay, let's just say bishop to d6 because this bishop isn't coming out to g5. Maybe you have a move like bishop d3. Now I like to take on c4 because after bishop takes c4, the bishop wastes a move coming to d3 first and then you force it to c4 instead of taking and allowing the bishop to move in one go. And then moves like b5, not b6, b5 are playable to get the bishop out to b7, maybe play a6 to support the pawn, even push b4 to kick the knight. You can consider moves like c5 in the future to open this bishop up and attack white center. Capablanca doesn't play it like that though. Capablanca takes on c4 on move 4. And Floor plays a4. You might be considering the move e4 in this position, opening up the bishop's attack on c4, supported by the knight, and not attacked by the d-pawn anymore, because the d-pawn captured on c4. This is typical Queen's Gambit type positions. But the Slav is a bit different, because the pawn is on c6 rather than e6, and b5 is playable, with support from the c6 pawn, to attack, sorry, to defend your extra pawn. Computer gives this zeros. After moves like bishop e2, b4, the position gets kind of crazy. You know, knight there, knight back to b1, knight takes e4. I don't know how far theory went back in the day in these sorts of lines. But floor goes a4 and avoids all of those complications after e4. Instead saying, look, you can't play b5 to support your pawn and I'm going to win it back. And then I'm going to have a d pawn and an e pawn. And you're only going to have an e-pawn, so I'm going to have a big center. Bishop f5 controls the e4 square twice, so e4 can't be played. Because if Capablanca gets lazy here, and, I don't know, plays a move like e6, then after e4, white kind of takes over the game. The bishop is going to be coming out to c4. There's not a lot you can do about it. You can play b5, because the knight is kind of overloaded. But after moves like e5 attacking the knight, knight fd7, let's say, knight takes b5, it's equal material. This pawn is probably going to fall. This knight is kind of dangerous. The rook is active. This diagonal is a bit weak for black. Don't get me wrong. Black doesn't have to do exactly that. He could play knight d5 in this position, which is probably a bit more active. Knight c6, putting pressure on the center. But black is just down a pawn. And you can claim that he has some positional compensation. But I don't believe in it. And neither does Capablanca. So Capablanca instead plays bishop f5. Just really taking hold of the e4 square. And it's difficult for white to actually add another defender to this square. So he goes e3. Bishop g5 was maybe possible to try and put pressure on the knight. Because if you can take the knight, then you might be able to play e4. But knight e4 is a bit of a problem. Attacking the bishop, attacking the knight, and getting the knight out of harm's way. If you trade here, I think it can only benefit black, because it's becoming more and more difficult to win this pawn after moves like bishop d5, maybe. Or maybe b5 becomes playable at this point. So, floor instead... By the way, I really hope I'm pronouncing that right. <laughs> maybe it's floor. I don't know. But I'm going for floor. <laughs> Please tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, he goes for e3. He blocks his dark squared bishop in, but he opens up an attack on the pawn. And b5 isn't playable because a takes, c takes, and knight takes. And you're simply going to lose both of the pawns and be down a pawn. So instead, Capablanca goes e6. He's got really nice control over the d5 square. So even if e4 is played by Floor at some point going to be difficult to actually go d5. Bishop c4, material is now equal. Bishop b4, attacking the knight. And if white, I don't know, just plays a move like h3, let's say, maybe there's ideas of knight e4, putting pressure on this knight. Computer doesn't believe in it. It says to sacrifice the pawn, play rook a2, maybe followed by like queen b3, looking at b7. And the bishop, if bishop a5 is played, bishop a3, black can't castle. So the computer just says give up a pawn. Floor instead decides to castle, which is a very principled move, getting out of the pin. 
black also castles. Queen e2 not only supports this bishop, which might be useful with stopping ideas of b5 if the knight is taken, but also adds more support for the move e4 in the future and just prepares to connect the rooks. One of the problems with white's position, though, is this bishop. He needs to try and do something. This bishop can come alive if e4 is played and the bishop is then opened up, but he needs to make e4 happen. Knight e4, black makes it even more difficult by just completely taking over the e4 square. If white trades here, he probably has to go knight d2 to put pressure on this bishop. If you get this trade, it's good for white, I would assume, because white has the bishop pair. f3 is probably going to come in to support e4 with tempo. Bishop c3, this diagonal might open up if d5 is played in the future. This bishop may drop back here at some point to put pressure on this long diagonal. The position is very comfortable for white. But black is, of course, not obliged to take this. He could play a move like bishop d5, offering a trade. He could drop the bishop back to g6. He could even play bishop c2, apparently, which is just weird and offer a repetition like this. So that's kind of hilarious. But that's not what we get. Floor doesn't take. Floor goes in knight to a2. So yes, he relieves some of his pressure on e4, which is going to make e4 harder to play. But he goes, yo, Capablanca, Jose, yo, Jose, where are you moving your bishop, bro? If you support, mm, not like that. If you support it with the queen, I'm just going to take you. And I'm going to get the bishop pair. And I'm going to put a knight on e5. And you're not going to have a good time. Capablanca is obviously one of the greatest players ever. And drops his bishop back to e7. And goes, yeah, okay. I'm a bit passive now, but what is your knight doing on a2, bro? If you go back to c3, maybe I just come back to b4 and offer you another repetition. Because Capablanca is playing black, and this isn't a case where he can just steamroll everyone. Capablanca is getting a bit older at this point. I think he's in his, I think he's like 51 at the time of this tournament. I was doing a lot of research into it, <laughs> or at least with the information available. And, um, He's not what he used to be, but he's certainly still a very strong player, no doubt. Bishop e7, bishop d3. So Floor decides that he's going to put pressure on the knight with the bishop. If he can trade the bishops off, then maybe e4 becomes a lot easier to play if the knight can come back to c3. Remember, the queen is also supporting an e4 push, potentially. If e4 is played in this position, I don't think it works. Knight f3, queen f3, you can't take here because your bishop's hanging, but bishop g6, apparently it becomes hard to defend d4. If you go for a move like bishop to e3, c5, and this bishop is undefended. So the best move is apparently bishop e2 giving the pawn up, or knight c3 giving the pawn up. And if you go queen e3, bishop f6, Again, it's difficult to defend this. If you try and push e5, ah, then yeah, there's still pins. Bishop d3, queen d3, and bishop e5 you can't take because of the pin. Floor is obviously one of the best players in 1938. He's also rated over 2700, which is far higher than I will ever be. And after knight g5, he doesn't push e4. He goes knight e1. Now, some of these knight maneuvers, they will continue, by the way. Just so weird. Like, knight a2, knight e1. Eventually in this game, there's going to be knight h7 as well. Like, it's so strange, the way that they play. And the, the engine blesses a lot of it. It really does. Which is, I mean, I say surprising. These are some incredible players, obviously. But... It's just very strange, the play style. You don't really get that nowadays. Players, I don't know, they're more confrontational, I feel like, and more concrete with their calculations. Whereas back in 1938, Flaw's just like, oh, your knight's kind of stupid, and you want to trade knights with me, so uh, no. No, what's your knight doing? If your knight comes back to e4, maybe I go f3. And then e4 is far easier to play because I have the support of the f-pawn. 
Bishop g6, Queen f2, defending the d4 square. This becomes far easier, even though knight e1 looks so ugly. Very interesting playstyle. And I feel like it's a bit more reminiscent of, like, over-the-board club-level chess. I'm not saying they're club-level. I'm saying when I play club-level chess over the board, so, like, 1900, 2000-ish is the type of player that I tend to play against. This is a bit bit more what it's like. Like, more just maneuvering and just strange moves, especially with some of the older guys. But bishop d3, and the point of knight e1 is revealed, you're going to take the bishop back with the knight, and then the knight becomes pretty active. Black does not have to take here. Like I say, knight e4 is playable, but then f3. But I guess the point is, if you play some kind of waiting move, then f4 is coming. And if the knight tries to slot into e4, then g4. If bishop goes back to g6, f5 cuts the connection off from the bishop and the knight. So black could get himself into a bit of trouble here if he doesn't handle the position correctly. So he notices the danger of a potential pawn storm. He takes the bishop, knight takes, the knight maneuvers from g1 to f3 to e1 to d3, looking at some fairly appetizing squares on f4, e5 and c5. Knight a6 is played, with the intention of coming to c7 potentially, to look at d5, which is a good square. If you go to d7, maybe you can go to b6 and access d5, but then you're vulnerable to moves like a5, locking your knight out of the game. And if you want to come to f6, I think Capablanca didn't want to do that, because he wanted this knight to maneuver from h7 to f6. Because, like I say, after the move, well, after the move knight c3, you can't go knight e4. So this knight needs to find another way back into the game. And e5 with knight e6 is not going to happen because white has too much control over this square. h6 is played here. By the way, f5 was apparently the best move. Just fighting for this e4 square, going, yeah, this is an ugly pawn. Maybe you can put pressure on it. But I don't want you to play e4 because once you play e4, your bishop comes alive. And my knight becomes a little bit silly. But h6 is still a great move. h6 with the intention of rerouting the knight through h7 to f6, probably. Rook d1 is played. Knight e5 is a bit more accurate, apparently. If f6, then I assume knight g6. And white is having a pretty good time. Also, knight c6 exists with um, an overloading of the pawn, which is quite cool. But rook d1, knight h7, knight e5, queen c7. Just putting pressure on the knight. Now e4 is played. Floor, after 17 moves of the game, finally plays e4. Finally opens his bishop up. d4 is nice and protected by the rook. There is no pressure on it. This knight is now looking a bit weird because it can't go to c7 even. Rook d8, bishop e3. Now, the computer doesn't love bishop e3. It prefers bishop f4. And there's some really interesting lines here. So, obviously, there's a discovery on um, the queen, potentially, at this point. Bishop d6 is a nice move to counter strike. Rook a c1, setting up potential discoveries. Because this pawn, after knight b5, is not going to be able to take. It's not really a discovery. It's just setting up a pin. And the only real move here to play on is bishop e5, bishop e5, and queen to e7. And black maintains some kind of equality, although white is pushing, probably because of the better space, better placed pieces. If black plays a kind of waiting move, I don't even know what you would play. Let's just say rook f8, then knight b5 is a problem. Because we're attacking the bishop, we're attacking the queen. You can't take because of the pin. Queen b8. And knight c6. Attacking the queen and the rook. So you have to take this. Then knight d6. And this attack is opened back up. Again, exploiting the overloading of the pawn. And kind of showing, yeah, this knight on a6, it's very awkwardly placed. 
Black has to find some moves like knight b4, give up the exchange. But white wins, essentially. Better, better than making a waiting move because you're not going to play this, is um, obviously you can take. But you can also play the move knight c5, which is just really weird. Because if you take, then takes. And black's doing well. Black's doing well here. The, the pawn structure is now symmetrical. White loses his strong d4 pawn. White's probably still in the driver's seat. But black's doing fine. The knight's a bit stupid as well, because it can't really go anywhere useful, because it's restricted by this c6 pawn. So, yeah, you don't have to take this, obviously. Uh, better is like queen e3, and I guess it's just a lot of tension in the position. But we get bishop e3. We get bishop e3. And after knight b4, rook a c1, knight to f6, knight b5 isn't as effective here because queen b8, and the knight just has to retreat. So after h3, queen a5, queen c4 is played. This is apparently inaccurate. b3 is a bit better. Knight c4 is a bit better attacking the queen as well. But queen c4 is played. I honestly couldn't tell you the point. I guess the queen can't really be attacked by anything. But I don't know what it's doing. Maybe trying to set up some sacrifices on f7 with pressure on e6. But without a light squared bishop, that's very difficult. Knight d7. Knight f3. Knight b6. Queen b3. The game is basically drawn at this point. Queen a6. Just gets on this diagonal. Control c4 a bit better. Knight e5. Knight d7 offering a trade. White declines. Black again offers a trade. White now accepts it. If the queen takes, then I assume d5 with a discovery. And a lot of pressure on e6 is a big problem for black. So he takes with the pawn instead. d5 anyway. Takes. Takes. Knight d3. Now d3 is a very accurate move. Because if you take again, moves like knight b5 are apparently a bit problematic for black. Because now knight d3 is not playable, because the queen's scope is cut off. You may have ideas like knight c7, or rook c7. d5 is probably going to fall after a move like bishop to d2 pressuring the knight. b6 is also vulnerable. And this bishop is kind of not doing a whole lot, apart from just defending the knight. So this was apparently a bit of an issue for black. And a sample line with rook d7, knight c7, queen a5, bishop d2... Kind of shows how this could become a bit of an issue for black. But it's nothing major. Knight d3 is a bit more accurate though. Rook c2. Because obviously the rook's under attack. Knight c5. Takes. Takes. Knight e4. Takes. 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 Knight c5. This game does get interesting. It does. I know everything's getting traded. But after d4. Rook d5. The material's equal. It's rook and queen versus rook and queen. Now, white's pawn structure is a bit better than black's, and he also has a bit more activity. His rook is pressuring this pawn. The queen is doing a good job defending a ton of stuff. This rook is a bit passive, and these pawns are split. White's pawns, however, are together. So if, B3, if b3 is played, then it can defend the a4 pawn, whereas black's pawns can't do that. This game shuffles a bit. Queen e6, pinning the queen to the rook. Queen f3, putting pressure on b7, and then going... You know, if you play a move like rook to e8, then I'm going to take on d4 and grind out this pawn up endgame. Queen goes back to b6, defending this, attacking b2. Rook back to b5. Queen a6, putting pressure on a4. Queen b3, defending. And queen d6. Rook d5. Queen e6, again, pinning, so you can't take. If um, the queen takes on b7, then queen e1, king h2, queen takes f2 is a bit of an issue because you are defending the d4 pawn. You can maybe try and push these queenside pawns, but realistically you're probably going to get into some kind of perpetual. But after queen f3, black goes queen c6. And apparently this is a mistake. After b3... The queen defends b3. The b3 de pawn defends a4. The queen defends the rook. And how are you protecting d3? So the most accurate line... Well, one of the most natural 
moves or most accurate moves is rook c8 here and after rook d4 queen takes pawn takes white ruins the kingside structure but it becomes difficult for black to hold on to his pawn on c7 and the white king can march up why is it pawn up and you know if both of these pawns were taken off the board probably a draw especially considering the weakness of the white king side but 2v1 is a bit more tricky and the white king can run out fairly quickly now in this position wait was it rook takes d4 let me check let me let me check exactly how it ended real quick Okay, yeah, so instead of b3, rook takes d4 was played in this position. b3, defending a4, and also after queen c1 check, the b2 pawn wouldn't be hanging because it's on b3. Now, if this queen trade is played, you have a similar sort of position to what I showed here. But you don't do that. As black, you play queen c1 check, and after the block, or king h2, you take on b2, and now it's completely drawn because the pawn structure is uh, essentially identical. But yeah, white just missed the idea of b3. And queen c1 is now lo no longer effective to pick up b2. And d4 is falling. White misses this and this game is a draw. Game 2, Samuel Roshevsky versus Alexander Alekhine. We And Alekhine is like undisputed world champion best player in the world at this point botvinnik is actually higher rated as you can see in the lineup but botvinnik is also young at this point and he doesn't i don't think come quite into his prime yet until like the 1950s i want to say yeah i, I want to say the 50s so d4 knight f6 roshevsky plays an indian and he goes for a Nimzo Indian, Bishop b4. g3 is played by Alakine, and to be honest, this looks very modern. Like, this is the kind of thing that would get played today, I feel like. c5 by Roshevsky, d5, and you have more of a Benoni type structure potentially brewing. If, um, I don't know, something like this were to happen, and like d6, you have a very Benoni uh, style of game. Knight e4 is played immediately, just putting a ton of pressure on this knight. Bishop d2, take, bishop takes, knight takes, and pawn takes. So two sets of minor pieces come off the board, and this position looks fairly drawish, with quite a few pieces already being exchanged, but later on, this game gets pretty wild. e d5, c d5, d6, knight f3, castle, bishop g2. All just standard developing moves really. Knight d7, Alakine castles, Roshevsky puts the knight on f6 to pressure white's center. Knight comes back to d2, which I guess opens this bishop up. Um, c4 is a move that I would kind of expect to be played just to secure this pawn forever, but maybe moves like b5 undermining Alakine didn't really like, although I don't know, maybe queen b3 is nice in this position. Queen d3 is apparently the best move, but not by much. Knight f6, knight d2. Maybe Alakine wanted to leave the c4 square open so that he could go a4 and knight c4 to put pressure on the weak d6 pawn. Rook e8, e4, b5, rook e1, rook b8, a3. Alakai makes it very difficult for Ryshevsky to play b4, because if he tries to go b4 at this point, takes, 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 you can just take on a7, your upper pawn, black has some decent counterplay, maybe this bishop's going to come alive, although I'm not really sure where to, like d7 isn't that appetizing. Queen b6 is also playable, hitting some of the weaknesses in the white position, rook a8, Knight g4 is potentially coming in to put pressure on f2. This position, whilst you're a pawn up, isn't that comfortable for white because black is dominating the queen side. Rook b7 is played by Ryshevsky. <clears throat> it's kind of a weird move. I guess it defends a7. And maybe you want to just play b4 anyway. But then I don't know how you're going to take this pawn back. Maybe queen b6 is brewing. 
c4 by Alakine. If b4 is played, then a b4. You can't play rook b4 because of rook a7. c b4, knight b3, and c5 is going to be a problem. Because a5 is under lock by the knight and the rook. a7 is still pressured by the rook. This pawn can't move anywhere. c5 is now supported by the knight. And if c5, let's just say black plays a waiting move. If a move like c5 comes in and d takes e5, I don't know if this works in this exact position, but if the knight has to like retreat to d7, this is going to become incredibly difficult for black to manage, especially with the alignment of the bishop to the rook. Moves like e6 coming in, black's bishop is horrible, and I mean, white just has a whole lot of activity in this position. Ruszewski, however, is rated over 2700 and after c4 he goes a6 he goes look if you take me i'm going to take back and now my pawns might actually be kind of dangerous and your a3 pawn not so much if you go a4 i'm going to go b4 and these pawns could get rolling bishop f1 by alakine an interesting move saying yeah this diagonal is not opening up anytime soon e4 is very well defended and because e4 is well defended d5 is well protected so instead this diagonal looks more interesting and i'm going to get my bishop on that one bishop d7 kind of tries to counter the bishop on f1 because they're both staring at b5 f3 just securing the e4 pawn to kind of relieve the duties of the knight and the rook and it's very unlikely that this diagonal is going to become weak enough for f3 to be a problem Queen c7, queen c2. Both players just developing. Rook e7 is a bit of a weird move. I don't think I could really explain it, to be honest. But yeah, let me know if you have an idea of what that was for. Knight b3 is played. Again, if you take this as Ryshevsky, the knight is going to come back to d2 most likely. And you want to play knight takes c4. Let's just say a move like h6 is played. You apparently don't even have to rush with it. But if you do go knight c4. Okay then bishop b5. Trying to trade the knight off for the bishop. So a4 is a bit better. Not allowing this. Again let's say a waiting move is played. Then knight c4. This knight is very strong. e5 might be coming in at some point as well. Maybe f4 e5. To again create a bit of a passed pawn situation. And then knight blockades the c5 pawn very nicely. a5 is played by Ryshevsky. And this is an inaccuracy. Because after cb5, bishop b5, Alakine goes queen c3. And his point is that a5 is quite weak. And maybe white can control the b file. Rook, bishop f1, sorry. Rook f1. Rook b5 defends a5. Rook a b1. The computer likes this maneuver, but okay. Rook b1, queen b8, knight d2, rook e b7. So I guess the point of the rook going to e7 is made clear because I suppose I suppose Ryshevsky wanted to control the b file with the two rooks first and then the queen behind instead of the rook coming to b8 and the queen going to e7. Rook b5, rook b5, knight c4, again pressuring a5, pressuring d6. f4, e5 might be coming in at some point. This rook is kind of free to go where it wants. This knight is also not great, because if this knight drops back to a square like d7, I know a5 is hanging, but we're not going to worry about that. f4 just takes away the knight's future. It's not going anywhere. And e5 is going to be coming at some point. It's going to be an issue. A4 is played, going, yeah, there's a lot of pressure on this pawn, so I'm just going to move it. E5, D E5, D6. Alakine doesn't take the pawn back. He could have played Queen E5 and traded the Queens off like this, but then your winning chances are severely reduced. C4 attacking the pawn, you're going to have to take here. You're just going to trade down into a draw and end game. If anything, black is maybe a bit more active. But d6 cuts the queen's connection to e5 off. And this pawn is two squares away from promotion. Rook b1, trying to trade queen e5. Takes takes, and queen to b3. If the queen starts trying to give checks, then... 
Okay, that actually blunders the knight, so don't do that. <laughs> King e2 is the most accurate, and after queen c2, knight d2, you can't play this check because the knight controls that square. This is still a drawn position after c4, I guess threatening queen d3, but it's also the only move. Queen d4 defending the square, putting pressure, preparing d7. Black has to find some difficult moves. I guess c3 makes sense though. d7, you have to sack the knight, and everything... Well, if everything gets traded, white actually wins. So I guess... Oh, you're getting back rank mated, so g6. But the knight isn't going anywhere because it's pinned. Queen d3, queen b2 maintaining the pin. It's an interesting position. Because you still can't take because the queen would hang. And if you take with the queen and trade everything, then white's going to win a4. So I guess the point is just to maintain this pin forever. And if the king tries to move then here here a free is gonna hang with check very interesting position it really is because black's down a piece but this pawn is putting so much pressure on and his king it's vulnerable but it's not going to get checkmated by just a queen queen b3 is played though queen e2 Defending the knight, which is defending a3, and defending d6. h6, just making sure that he doesn't get back rank mated. King g2, queen c3, knight e3, and the game is drawn. The game is drawn. g6, knight g4, attacking the knight. All black needs to do is trade. And the queen and pawn endgame is apparently a draw. Queen d4 attacking the pawn, queen e7 defending. This isn't what happened, this is just what could happen. Give some checks if the king runs off to h3. Queen d3 prepares queen to f1 with potentially some mating ideas. So the king has to return really and the checks just kind of continue. But king g7 is played. And this loses the game on the spot. To knight f6. If king takes f6, d7, and you can't stop this pawn from promoting, queen d4 defends, queen to e8, you can't add another defender to this square, and if you start trying to give checks, the king can hide on h3. And this is going to come with check when it promotes as well, which I think is a bit of a problem. So... Yeah, Roshevsky just blunders the game away. He takes with the queen, though. Queen d1 is played. Now, d7 is more accurate, apparently. Just threatening, like, queen e8 and promotion. Queen d4 getting behind the pawn. Queen e7. Again, if you start trying to give checks, you can't, you can't check the king again. It's safe, because this is controlled by the queen, which would be the checking square. Alakine goes queen d1. And kind of gives his advantage away. But queen d8 is played. He still has an advantage after d4. Sorry, d7. c4. And he takes on a4. And apparently this gives everything away after c3. Because this queen is going to be deflected. Black is going to take here. And black can handle one pawn. Considering the weakness of the white king. What Alakai needed to do. Was go queen to d5. And if c3 is played, then queen e5 check. If the king goes to g8, or, well, he can't go to h8, then queen e8 check wins the game. If the king goes to f8, check. If the king stays on the back rank, then you lose. If you go back to g7, then the c3 pawn falls with check. If the king goes back to h7, queen c8, you can't stop promotion. So what black needs to do in this position apparently is go f6, blocking this diagonal. Again, you can't take because of takes. Queen c6, again trying to go for queen to c8. King f7. If queen c8, then king e7. Black is okay. It's crazy. King f7, you can take here of check. King e7. The pawn is falling. Queen e4, take, take. This is the best line the computer can find. It's wild. But Alakine gives the game away. 
Queen a4, c3, queen c6, c2, check, king h7, take, take, Alakine's up a pawn, and he's going to try and convert this, he's going to try and push the pawn, with the black queen blockades, give some checks, and there's really nothing that Alakine can do, he tries to bring his king, but it's just going to get checked forever, I don't know if that was a free fall of repetition or not, no, they just agree to a draw in this position. And yeah, Vrashevsky draws to the reigning world champion, Alexander Alakine, in game two. Very intense match. Alakine should have won after this whole uh, knight, sorry, king to g7. But some very intricate lines that actually allowed him to win. And, you know, people are human at the end of the day. So... Game three, Paul Kerez versus Max Yu. I think it's Yu. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. From the Netherlands versus Paul Kerez from Estonia. We have D4, E6, C4. By the way, stick around for the next game because the final game, Botvinnik versus um, Fine, is wild. C4, Bishop B4 check. We have another type of um, Nimzo Indian just without Knight F6. Apparently this is the Keres variation, and um, I mean it's named after this bloke, clearly. F5. I actually had someone in my Discord server who said that he plays this line. No, 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 in a comment, in a comment. Um, someone said that they play that line, and I was like, what? This is a thing? Apparently, yeah. And we'll see Keres <laughs> play it in action. Queen to e7 defending the bishop. A3, takes, takes. Keres wants you to provoke him to take before he takes so that he gets the extra tempo. And this just goes into a Dutch defense. Knight f6, black has big control over e4. g3, d6, knight f3, b6. The bishops develop on the long diagonal opposing each other, but white has the bishop pair. Castles knight bd7, b4. You take space on the queen side and he goes, look bro, if you're going to castle queen side, I'm going to come storming in, and you're going to lose. So Keres goes, okay, you can take some space, but I'm not going to get checkmated. Bishop b2. Lining up potential attacks on the king side with the double Fianchetto. Rook a c8. By the way, you might be wondering about moves like knight to e4 attacking the queen. Totally playable. Um, Rook a b8 is apparently the best, which is just a weird move. It's a very positional sort of game at this point. Rook a c8, rook fd1, c5. Keres makes the first like confrontational move and goes, you know, if you want to trade with me, like let's just say you trade everything here, then my position is very nice. C4 is weak. Knight a4 is potentially coming. I have big like insane control over the e4 square, which is what the Dutch defense is kind of all about. And d6 is defended. Uh, Yu, however, is one of the best players of his time, and he takes with a D pawn, and after B takes, he doesn't take again. B5 is the best move, just pushing forward and maybe trying to create a passed pawn. He goes for Queen D3, Knight B6, and now B5. This is apparently a mistake because of the move E5, and Black is threatening E4, so after sorry, Queen C2, keeping an eye on C4 e4, knight g5. I'm not sure what Keres didn't like in this position. If h6, knight h3, maybe he didn't like the knight coming to f4. But the computer's just saying, yo, throw all your pawns. It's scary to let the bishop just be on this diagonal. But queen c3 can never be played because of knight a4. So this isn't that dangerous. However, after b5, uh, Keres plays rook f to d8, maybe trying to play d5, although I guess he already has insane support for that push as it is. a4 by you, d5, takes, rook takes, queen retreats, rook d1, queen d1, and knight c4 attacking the bishop. Bishop goes to c1, this is a mistake, taking on f6 was better, although it's difficult to give up this glorious bishop. And just trying to put pressure on c5, because 
c5 is the only isolated pawn in the position and it is weak it is definitely weak u decides to try and keep his bishop on the board e5 queen b3 pinning the knight to the king bishop d5 and this looks scary because after knight d2 if you take the bishop king takes bishop this knight can't move and it can't be defended well it can be defended once but you're still going to lose a piece so queen b3 bishop d5 knight d2 e4 is played cutting the bishop's connection off if knight c4 is played if you take and take you're down a piece but queen f7 and the knight can't be defended here bishop takes queen b2 black's apparently okay and we have that kind of thing play out except queen to e6 is played rather than queen to f7 bishop h3 puts pressure on the f5 pawn bishop c4 queen c2 bishop goes back to d5 which is apparently inaccurate bishop b3 was better even though it allows this tactic i guess c4 and i don't know maybe knight to d5 it's hard to believe that giving a pawn up here is actually viable but the computer thinks so bishop d5 is played a5 u tries to break through potentially with moves like b6 or maybe a6 and b6 because the queen can't really help because this bishop is putting pressure on f5 bishop b7 u is taking over this game bishop b2 this knight isn't great and the bishop's putting a lot of pressure on these pawns are finally advanced to the fifth rank they could cause some issues the bishop's putting pressure on f5 this queen is going to be overloaded potentially knight d5 queen c4 pinning the knight to the queen h5 e3 u continues to play well king h7 relieving potential checks or pins rook d1 g6 just protecting the f5 pawn the bishop goes back to f1 to defend the queen this is looking very dangerous because let's imagine for a second the queen can get to c3 it's going to be difficult to defend your king side as well rook c7 queen b3 not the most accurate h4 is apparently better to clamp down on g5 but queen b3 is a good move if um black plays i don't know king h6 for example then bishop c4 this is a ton of pressure and it's going to become very difficult to maintain the defense of this knight or this pawn for that matter rook d7 bishop c4 king h6 h4 f4 f4 what a move now if you take this then e3 and black's actually got a counterplay he opens this bishop up queen h3 and there could be mating ideas if you take queen h3 this is very dangerous you know queen takes g3 check as well white's actually going to get mated so f5 is a great find and uh, if you take with the g pawn then queen g4 check and i think you're losing after knight e3 with discovered attack on the rook and the queen lining up with the rook as well keras creates some excellent chances e takes f4 is played if you don't take it then f3 and queen h3 are problems ef4 e3 bishop d5 is played which is apparently a mistake a6 is better but okay i wouldn't call this a mistake e2 what a move just leaving the queen hanging leaving the bishop under attack black is down a piece but e2 rook has to go to e1 to stop promotion queen d5 queen d5 rook d5 f3 is played if you take you're going to get mated crazy f3 is played though rook d1 and the players agree to a draw in this position after king f2 bishop f3 you can't take because the rook hangs it's basically going to become an opposite colored bishop end game and the players believe this is a drawn position which it probably is maybe black can try and push for something maybe white can try and push but at the end of the day these rooks are likely to get exchanged and there's really nothing in this position because something needs to keep an eye on e1 
these pawns are probably going to fall due to this bishop. I mean, if, like, bishop to d5 is nice if you take... The game is basically over because you can't defend. This bishop's going to probably pick up these pawns. And even if you're up, like, two pawns in this position as the um, black pieces, it's still probably a draw. So they agree to a draw after... I think after rook d1, actually, they agree to a draw. And yeah, you had chances to win this game. But f5 was a fantastic resource from Keres to just open up lines against the white king. And white needed to find some really tough moves in this position. But even this apparently doesn't keep the advantage. Like queen c2 needs to be played. Just allowing captures, like, very, very tough. And Keres pulls a great defensive, well, attacking defense, really, out of the bag to get a draw against you. Final game. Final game. If you're still around, by the way, I really hope you're enjoying this video because I'm having a lot of fun making it. Um, I, you might be able to tell. I feel like I'm a bit more energetic than usual, but this is so interesting to me, especially like the play styles of these old players. Like F5, what a move. Modern players, I'm sure, would find that. But, I don't know, the positions, they just seem more manoeuvring and more intense rather than, like, concrete, like modern games tend to be. Nothing against modern players, by the way. Just a different style of gameplay. And if you are enjoying the video and you're not already subscribed, please do subscribe. If you're already subscribed, then, yo, thank you very much. And I hope you like this, um, not change in the channel this new series and this could be the start of a lot of these kinds of videos if you guys would enjoy so botvinnik versus fine botvinnik after uh world war ii becomes one of like an incredibly dominant player and he kind of like starts the whole soviet hegemony over the chess world and you know, he's kind of considered the father of Soviet chess, the Botvinnik school of chess, the Soviet school of chess. Botvinnik is at the head of it all. And he's young at this point. I can't remember exactly how young, but I want to say in like his 30s. May yeah, maybe his 30s, maybe late 20s. Already the highest rated player in the world. But can he prove it in this tournament? Because this is the tournament. The American Ruben Fine, which by the way, I'd never heard of. I don't know why I've never heard of him, because he's an incredibly high-rated American player, and at this point, America didn't have that many uh, really high-rated players compared to how they do today, or during like the 50s and 60s. So, Ruben Fine actually wrote uh, a lot of annotations, or maybe it was during an interview, but the PGN that I downloaded, basically, has loads of annotations from Fine. So I'll talk you through those as we go through the game. E4. Ruben Fine already makes a note. He says, before this tournament, I was known as a D4 player. Hence, my first move must have come as somewhat of a surprise to Botvinnik. E6 is played by Vot Botvinnik, the French defence. And Fine says, Botvinnik does not vary. Against E4, he almost invariably played the French. Sometimes he tried the Sicilian. And this is interesting, because the French today is often considered just straight up bad. Just, just a bad opening. Botvinnik is the highest rated player in the world in 1938. And he goes on to be one of the most dominant players in the 50s. And he plays the French, according to Fine, almost exclusively. D4, D5, Knight C3, Bishop B4. We have the winner were French. E5, C5. And in this position, Knight F3 is... The traditional move. I think a3 is also a very common move. Fine takes. And he says this is the prepared move. Unlike you, I make it a rule not to analyse such lines too profoundly before the game. Because it is most essential to be able to meet whatever surprises come up over the board. And not everything can be foreseen. That's such an interesting quote. Like, it's so different to chess now. Like... Nowadays, everything is prepared. You know, players like Fabiano Caruana, I love Fabi, by the way, so this is throwing no shade at Fabi, but he knows so much opening theory. Like, he knows basically everything. 
And the problem is, when he does get surprised in the opening, which I think we have seen during the current Norway chess tournament, he doesn't crumble, but he seems to struggle a bit. Whereas what Rob, what, what uh, Ruben Fine is saying is, you know, some players like to prepare against as much as they can. And he's saying that Max Yu does this. I don't know how accurate that is, but apparently so. And he's saying, look, I, I'll look at some lines, but I'm not going to do it anything over the top because chances are I get surprised. And then what? I've wasted a bunch of time preparing openings that don't even happen. Really interesting take from, you know, an incredibly strong player. 97. Although I suppose opening prep was a lot more difficult back in 1938 because obviously you don't have computers and you also don't have that many like chess books compared to what would have been the case in like the 70s with Bobby Fischer. So 97, knight f3. Of course, this can just be taken. But Fine may have prepared at knight to a4. If the check is given, I assume b f sorry c3 is the idea. And maybe you just chase the bishop all the way back to c7. Because the knight controls b6. Very interesting type of French structure. Because you hardly ever take here. But that's not what's played. Knight bc6 is played. Bishop d3. And d4. Apparently this goes back into some theory. The knight is hanging. And it can't move because of the pin. But a3 is the only move. If you take this... Then a b4, c b2, bishop b2 if knight b4, bishop e4, and c2 is defended, b7's under a bit of attack. The queens can get traded in this position. By the way, this isn't what happens. And I don't know, I guess, oh, I think it's better to take with the king and just maintain pressure on the a file. And maybe go king e2, rook hd1. And White has a small edge in this position. I guess he's got a bit more space with the pawns, although this pawn structure is ugly. Maybe this knight is going to transfer to b5 to try and get into some of the weaknesses. White also has the bishop pair. The black bishop isn't great, but it's interesting. And yeah, Fine makes a note here. The d4 by Botvinnik is essentially Botvinnik accepting the complications he says after bishop c5 castles, white's game is freer. Because if d4 is played at this point, then knight e4. And, you know, the knight can actually move because previously it's pinned to the king. But Fine says that Botvinnik accepts the complications after a3, bishop a5, b4, knight b4, a b4, bishop b4. Maintaining this pin, bishop b5 check is a mistake. Castling is better. And after bishop c3, Botvinnik is up a pawn. Rook b1 puts pressure on b7, making it difficult for this rook, sorry, for the bishop to um, develop. Castling would give the Greek gift sacrifice. <laughs> Ruben Fine is preparing a Greek gift. King g obviously, um, oh, I just lost the line. Oh, there we go. If the king goes back to g8, then queen h5, you're getting mated. Um, there's not a lot you can do about it. And if the king comes out to g6, then queen g4, there's a lot of problems in this position. It's kind of over. Of course, Botvinnik would not castle after this, this, this. Botvinnik, I mean, we don't know what he would play. But h6 is the best move, just stopping any ideas of knight g5. And then black can castle. Um... And Ke Fine does say that castling was an option, but he said that bishop b5 was part of his preparation. And after knight c6, bishop c6, bc6, and he says knight c6 is the fatal error. Wow. So bishop d7, he said, is the only move for black. The computer may disagree, but... And this does cut the queen's connection to d4, so queen d4 is playable. And if you take here, then queen b4, white is winning. But you can do it like this. Oh yeah, because then you win the piece back. And white can't castle, which is kind of an issue. Knight d4 kicks the 
bishop, bishop a6, making sure white can't castle, bishop g5. I guess fine had prepared this position. Maybe c6 is coming in with pressure on the bishop, on the knight. It's an interesting position. But he says knight c6 is losing. After bishop takes, b takes, rook a4, very interesting move. And it's the only move to maintain an advantage with white. Bishop c3, bishop d2, and f the computer says plus 0.1. But Fine says that suddenly black discovers that he is lost. The bishop is hopelessly shut in. He's talking about the light squared bishop. Bishop a6 isn't playable because it's controlled. Bishop b7, you're stuck behind the c6 pawn, which can't move. And bishop d7, you're stuck behind the e6 and c6 pawns, which can't move. And he says the bishop's hopelessly shut out, and it's only a question of time before white's superior development makes itself felt. So interesting. And he says f6 is a desperate attempt by Botvinnik to try and free the bishop, because if you take, then e5 is going to be playable in the future. Fine ignores him. He castles. If you take here, bishop c3, d c3, queen d8, king d8, knight e5. The bishop still can't develop. White forks, well, he's forking a forking square and the pawn on c6. So after rook f8, rook d1, king c7, rook d6, it's basically game over. Bishop b7 defending, then rook d7, king c8. Well, okay, let's say king b8, then rook b4. So king c8, it's just ridiculous the amount of pressure that white has on this position black simply can't get out and this is fine's point complete positional strangulation castles by black bishop c3 dc3 and queen e1 he doesn't even trade the queens he just goes after c3 and puts a bit more added defense on the e5 pawn a5 is played by botvinnik and i think this is a very practical move to try and get the bishop out to a6. Queen c3, bishop a6, rook f a1, which is an inaccuracy. Mm? No, I don't think it's an inaccuracy. Bishop b5, rook d4, and the problem is, after rook d6, you can't do a lot as black, and you have so many weaknesses. Again, this could be taken at any point, but knight takes, and the knight is just super active. He says that in this position oh he was saying that Botvinnik was hoping for rook takes a5 and he says that this would give some freedom to the black position after something like rook takes queen d1 queen e1 black can force a trade of queens and if you take with the queen then obviously you can trade like this and yeah fine says that although he's up a pawn it's a doubled c pawn and black actually has a bit of counterplay with moves like rook to d8. So he doesn't allow this. He doesn't allow it. He goes rook d4, queen e7, rook d6. And the position becomes so difficult. Botvinnik finds the best move, a4, to tie the rook down, as um, Fine says. By the way, this annotation is awesome. I love the fact that there's comments from him. Queen e3 threatens to win a pawn, but not in an obvious way. Oh, okay, let's say black makes a nothing move, like king h8. What's the idea? Is it knight d4? Going after e6? Or c6? Apparently that's not good. Or maybe it's just taking like this and opening up a discovery on e6. And if rook takes defending, knight e5 going after c6, rook f to f8. Oh, you're also supporting c4, winning the a4 pawn, potentially. Very interesting. So this was Fine's idea. Rook a7, knight d2, a3, c4, bishop a4, take, queen takes, and then rook a3. Fine goes up a pawn. And now he has to continue to try and convert this. e8. And here, Fine plays what he a move that he really liked. h3. 
And he says after this quiet move, Black might as well resign. And I guess his point is, Black's only source of counterplay was potential back rank mates or forcing the knight to f1 with a back rank check. But he's saying that Black's position is busted. There's way too much pressure going on. Once this knight gets into the game, it's going to become even harder as well. And if the rooks infiltrate the back rank, it I mean, defending is going to be so, so difficult. Because the king can always hang out on a square like h2. Rook a to a8, knight f3, queen b2, knight e5. And you start to see the problems in the position. Queen b1 check, king h2, queen f5, queen g3. And in this position on move 31, Mikhail Botvinnik resigns the game in the final game of round 1. And I will show you the standings after round 1. And Botvinnik, the highest rated player in the world at this point. Obviously it's just round 1, but he is bottom of the leaderboard. And yeah, Fine says in this position there's too many threats. Black can't guard the 7th rank. Black does not have a single move. And Rook to F3 is threatened with Rook F7, Rook D7. And it's game over. Um, oh no, Botvinnik actually says this. He says Black does not have a single move. And Rook F3 is threatened. A combination of a splendid strategic idea with tactical subtleties. Wow, that's so cool, the way that the players talk about the game like that. And the fact that we have access to that, it's like 85 years old. Like, that's awesome. Or is it 85? 86? Whatever. That's so cool. And yet, black just doesn't have moves. The top computer line, rook a7, knight c6, the rook's under attack, rook a to a8. Sorry, no, sorry, rook a to a8. The rook just shuffles from a7 to a8. The knight goes back to e5, maybe forcing this in. But if we go more with Botvinnik's idea of rook f3, queen h5. I mean, you can't play rook f7 here because the rook helps out in the defense. The rook can go back to a3 according to the computer. Rook fd3 going for rook to d8 is an issue. The knight can jump to d7, trying to go knight to f6 if king h8. Queen f4, you're threatening back rank mating ideas. And yeah, it is kind of game over. Maybe the knight's going to come in like this? White strangles the black position, essentially. And Botvinnik loses, and he does it with grace, considering those uh, comments. And yeah, Ruben Fine leads the tournament in round one. If you guys enjoyed this video and stuck around until the end, I know it was very long, but I wanted to give these games the credit they deserve and I wanted to dive into some of the lines even on the games that were drawn I know three of the games were drawn but they were spectacular still that f what was it that f4 move from Keres crazy crazy um that's it for today's video uh, if you want to see round two please let me know because I would love to make a video on it and yeah, I love these historical chess games. Uh, I'm more than happy to be doing more of them. But for now, the Avro Chess Tournament has 14 rounds. So plenty more to go through. And I'll see you guys in the next video.